We're live. We're live. Okay. Oh, that sound real good. Sound real good in that phone. Oh shit! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We are reading today six of our ongoing teaching at Say Their Name Square. Today we are reading Rise of the Warrior Cop: The Militarization of America's Police Forces by Riley Balco. I change sets for a little bit. I change sets for the night. We are on. Uh, oh no, I lost my page. We're on chapter seven about the the 1990s. It's all about the numbers. Cars get real close. See how close cars get? Damn, that's in camera. Okay. Start this. Uh, okay. I'm going to go back and read the last page. Uh, of course, just as it was possible to think David Koresh was a madman and be appalled by the federal government seized at Waco, it was also possible to believe the ATF deserved. It was also possible to believe the ATF deserved sharp criticism for its handling of both Ruby Ridge and and Waco, and be appalled that Timothy McVeigh's retaliatory murder of 164 innocent people. But McVeigh's actions, but McVeigh's actions seem to cement seem to cement partisan battle lines for years to come at least when it came to ATF abuses. Oh no. I'd already read this. Damn, I already read this whole lie. Okay, I lied, I lied. Uh, okay. We're gonna pick up. I'm sorry, I misread, I misread. We're gonna pick up right, right here. As police militarization began to creep beyond the drug war into other police actions in the 1990s, the country's major political ideologies continued to react through the prism, react through the prism of partisan art, of partisan affiliation. When George W. Bush moved into the White House in 2001, conservatives stopped caring about the police, about police heavy handling, heavy handedness though there were a few exceptions. Progressives then, ro- progressives then rose up to decry the raids of medical marijuana clinics and the, disp- and the disproportionate use of SWAT teams and paramilitary tactics against the minority groups on immigration raids and at political protests. Both sides were capable of righteous anger when the opposing party was in when the opposing party was in power and using drug and using big guns to enforce policies they found objectable at the same time both sides were more willing to endorse the heavy both sides were willing to endorse the heavy-handed police tactics on their on their political opponent on their political opponents. It's a trend that is a trend that continues today and further enables domestic police militarization to continue to flourish. In nineteen eighty nine, a friend as Peter Peter Kraska a friend as Peter Kraska if you wanted to tag along for a US Coast Guard exercise on Lake Erie. Kraska is a criminologist at the University of Eastern Kentucky. His students describe him as a demanding, whip smart, and in the words of one female student, a strangely hot lumberjack. He agreed to go along, mostly out of curiosity. While on that trip, Kraska learned that the U- while on that trip, Kraska learned that the Coast Guard worked closely with the U.S. Navy on drug interdiction efforts. The Navy itself would intercept boats or ships that fit drug couriers profile that fit, that fit drug courier profiles, but would then have Coast Guard personnel on board to conduct the actual searches, seizures, and arrests. 
One Coast Guard officer flatly admitted that Kraska flatly admitted to Kraska that the procedure was a way of getting around the Navy's policy prohibiting its personnel from participating in civil police actions. Kraska was both alarmed and intrigued. The experience started him down a road of a scholarship focused on examining the ways in which the U.S. military was increasingly being drawn was increasingly being drawn into enforcing with drug laws into enforcing drug laws in particular Kraska began looking into indirect militarization the rise of SWAT teams and other paramilitary police unit, and other paramilitary police teams let me wait for this to go by What might be called the criminal justice industrial complex and the increasing tendency of public officials to address social problems with martial rhetoric and imagery to suggest military-like solutions from the wars on crime and drugs to the heavy weaponry and vehicles that police were beginning to use that police were beginning to use to the proposals that juvenile offenders be punished in boot camps. Kraska obtained funding to conduct two broad surveys of police departments on their use of SWAT teams. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Hello. His resulting reports systematically documented a previous unheeded two-decade insurgence of militarism into just about into just about every city and county in America. The numbers were staggering. By 1995, 89% of American cities with 50,000 or more people had at least one SWAT team, doubling the percentage from 1980. Among smaller cities, populations between 25,000 and 50,000, 60% had a SWAT team by 1995, a 157 increase over 10 years. Nearly 20% of all op- nearly 20% of all police officers in these town served on the SWAT team. A phenomenon that Kraska dubbed the militarization of Mayberry. By 1995, combining these figures for cities and towns, 77% of all American cities with over 20, 25,000 people had a SWAT team. Kraska then asked police department Kraska then asked police departments that had maintained SWAT teams going back to the early 1980s to report how many times the teams had been deployed over the years and for what reasons. Again, the numbers were jaw dropping. In the early 1980s, the aggregate number the aggregate annual number of SWAT deployments was just under 3,000. By 1995, it was just under 30,000. In 15 years, the number in 15 years, the number of annual SWAT team deployments in America had jumped by 937 percent. Some SWAT teams, Kraska found, were conducting up to 700 raids per year. What was precipitating the surge in SWAT? What was precipitating the surge in SWAT activity? The drug war, almost exclusively. Logan, Utah, is a typical example of the phenomenon. As of 2011, the city has just under 50,000 people. As of 2011, the city, the city had just under 50,000 people had had a murder in five years and had recently been raided the safest picture. Go back and listen to it back. Uh, go back and share this live. As of 2000, uh, no. Yet, since the mid-1980s, Logan has had its own SWAT team. What does a SWAT team do in a city with no violent crime? It creates violence out of non-violent crime. We haven't really had a whole lot of barricaded suspects, and certainly 
we haven't had an active gunman shooter. A department spokesman told a local told a local paper, but it was nice to have a SWAT team around just in case. In the meantime, he said, it's mostly used for assistance on high risk search warrants. High risk meaning all of all or most drug warrants. We've destroyed some doors over the years that maybe wouldn't have gotten destroyed if there wasn't a SWAT team. But it's all in the name of trying to make a high risk situation more safe for everyone. Some 43% of the police departments in Kraska's survey told him that they have used that they had used active duty military personnel to train the SWAT team when it first started. And 46% were training on a regular basis with active duty with active duty military experts in social operations. Usually the Army Rangers are Navy SEALs. Usually the Army Rangers are Navy SEALs. This was the goal of the joint task force set up during the during the Bush administration to encourage cooperation between local police, federal police, and the military in order to foster up a battlefield approach to drug enforcement. In a follow-up interview, one department SWAT, one department SWAT comment, um, I'm sorry, in a follow-up interview, one department SWAT commander told Kraska, we've had special forces, we've had special forces folks who have come right out of the jungles of Central and South America. These guys get into real shit. All branches of military service are involved in providing training to law enforcement. U.S. Marshals act as liaisons between the police and the military to set up training, our go-between. We've had teams of Navy SEALs and Army Rangers come here and teach us everything. We just have to use our judgment and exclude the information like, at this point, we bring in the motors and blow the place up. The commander added that he the commander added that he had received a letter from a four star general expressing concern about the sort of training the department was getting. Back in the eighteen fifties, the Cushing Doctrine had allowed federal marshals to summon US troops to enforce domestic to enforce domestic law. More than a hundred years after the controversial policy was repealed, by the uh, by the Pache Commodus Act, Commodus Act, Commodus Act, federal federal marshals were now soliciting elite U.S. personnel, U.S. military personnel again, not to enforce domestic law themselves, but to teach civilian police officers how to enforce the laws as if they were in the military. Perhaps most disturbing was Kraska's findings that these paramilitary police teams and aggressive tactics were increasingly being used even for regular patrols. By 1997, 20% of the departments he surveyed used SWAT teams or similar units for patrol, mostly in poor, high crime areas. This was an increase of 257% since 1989. SWAT proponents argued that all this buildup was in response to a real problem. After all, violent crime had soared in the 1980s and the early 1990s, but the SWAT teams weren't generally responding to violent crime. They were usually serving drug warrants. When Kraska and colleague Louis Kubelis Louis Cobellis compared changes in changes in violent crime rates to changes in the use of SWAT teams in the jurisdictions they surveyed. They found they found they found that only 6.63 percent of the rise in SWAT team deployments could be explained by the rise in crime rates. Kraska's finding prompted a surge of media interest in the phenomenon of, mili- of police militarization. 
The New York Times. Let's see. These buses are so close. Okay. Uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, National Journal, and ABC News all covered all covered Kraska's study and also ran their own investigations into the issue. But nothing really changed. Excuse me. Politicians and policymakers didn't seem to notice. Or if they did, they didn't care much. Kraska noted Kraska noted the seem the fizzling out of the issue in a self deprecating footnote in a book he edited a few years later. What exactly all this media attention accomplished is not quite clear. It resulted in no fame, no money, and no appreciable difference in the phenomenon itself. Um, okay. Of course, that wasn't Kraska's fault. Congress, state legislators, and other po- and other politicians, either. Oh, oh no! The coconut one. Uh, where was all the um no 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 uh congress state legislators and other politicians either weren't uh either weren't paying attention or just didn't find their reports particularly troubling in fact the phenomenon only continued to pick up momentum the year before <laughs> The year before Kraska's reports were published, Con- Congress had passed the National Defense Authorization Security Act of 1997, the biannual, biannual, biannual bill to fund the Pentagon. One provision in the bill created what is now usually called the 1033 program, named for the section of the U.S. Code assigned to it. The provision established the provision established a law enforcement support program, an agency headquartered in Fort Belvoir, uh, Fort Belvoir, Belvoir, Virginia. Its mission to further crease, to further grease the pipeline through which hardcore military gears flow to poli- civilian police agencies. I'm sorry. In certain, it, it certainly accomplished its mission. In its first three years. The office handled 3.4 million orders for Pentagon gear from 11,000 yeah, from 11,000 police agencies in all 50 states. By 2005, the number of police agencies serviced by the office hit 17,000. National Journal reported in 2000 that between 1997 and 1999, the office doled out 700 I'm sorry, 720, 727 million worth of equipment, including 253 aircraft, notably six and seven passenger airplanes, UH-60 Blackhawk, UH-60 Blackhawk, and UH-1 UV helicopters. 7,856 7, M16 rifles, 181 grenade launchers, 8,131 bulletproof helmets and 1,161 pairs of night vision goggles. With all that military gear, plus the federal, with all that military gear, plus the federal drug policing grants, with all that, I'm sorry, let me start this over, let me just start this over. With all that mili- military gear, plus the federal drug policing grants, and asset forfeiture proceedings. Just about anyone running a police department who wanted a SWAT team could now afford to start and fund one. And so the trend crept into smaller and smaller towns. By the mid 2000s, SWAT had come to Middleburg, Pennsylvania, population 1,363. Leesburg, Florida, 17,000. 
Mount Oreb, Mount Oreb, Ohio, 2,701. Nina, Nina, N-E-E-N-A, Wisconsin, 24,507. Harwich, Massachusetts, 11,000. And Butler, Missouri, 4,201, among others. In, re- in research for his ethnography, for his ethnography, for his ethnography on militarization, Kraska spent a good deal of time with cops and SWAT teams in these smaller cities. One general dynamic he observed was a kind of masculine-infused arms race between police agencies that could often lead to an inferiority complex at smaller departments. These officers strongly believed that small municipalities and county police were being left behind by not having special tactical teams. Kraska writes, smaller departments may have started acquiring SWAT teams because of the sudden surge in violence, not because of the sudden surge in violence or hostages taken or even drug activity. The town's police department simply saw that police departments had them, so they wanted one too. Neil Franklin, a narcotics cop in Maryland, also witnessed that aunt. Neil Franklin, a former narcotics cop in Maryland, also witnessed the dynamic over the course of his career. It's almost like they would get their own high off the money and the equipment. That agencies would get competitive. If a city department had a SWAT team, the county wanted one too. If one department upgraded to a more powerful gun or got an APV, all the departments nearby had to get the same thing. Stephen Downing, who worked in the same LAPD patrol bureau as Daryl Gates while Gates was developing his SWAT idea, explains how the move to smaller police departments makes the, makes already dangerous SWAT raids even more uh, perilous. Even more perilous. You'd have the I you would have this I want one too phenomenon. Downing says, and so the SWAT teams get bigger, and they start to spread, and the standards would start to drop. You have to be very careful about who you put on the SWAT team. The guys you, the guys who want it, the guys who want it most, are the ones you put on SWAT team. Oh, I'm sorry. The guys who want it most are the last ones who should be given a spot. At LAPD, you are choosing from a force of 9,000 strong. You're getting elite, disciplined officers, and the pool is big enough that you can screen them for fitness and marksmanship and all the usual stuff, but also for attitude and psychology. Choosing this isn't a luxury at smaller police agencies. Right now, I'm preparing to testify in a lawsuit stemming from a wrong-headed raid by a SWAT team in a 28-man police department. Downing Downing says, How do you even begin to select from 28 people? Several officers interviewed for this book made the, made the intuitive point that officers who wanted to be on a SWAT team are the last officers who should be selected for it. And how do they find time to train? At LAPD, the SWAT team will spend at least half their... Uh, at LAPD, the SWAT team will spend at least half their on-duty time in training. In these smaller towns, the SWAT team is something these guys do on the side. They're patrol officers, and so what happens is that they're trained by practicing on people. In the September 2011 issue of Tactical Edge magazine, Edge to Know, Uh, Ed Sano, a SWAT leader in Benton County, Idaho, no, I'm sorry, Benton County, Indiana, and a well-published author and consultant in police tactics, excuse me, uh, let's start this over, in September 2011, in the September 2011 issue of Tactical Edge, Edson Noho, a SWAT leader in Bang County, Indiana, and a well-published author and consultant on police tactics, suggests doing exactly that. 
practicing SWAT raids on low-level offenders. Team commanders must raise the profile of, of their teams, Sunil writes, stay active. And yes, yes, I mean do warrant service and drug raids, even if you have to poach the work. First, your team needs first, your team needs the training time under true call out conditions. If all your team does is train but seldom deploy, you will end up training just to train. You need to train to fight. Making deploying SWAT something that is routine, not something only done after much hand wringing. So yeah, this card sucks up on the score. Okay. As it as had been happening throughout the drug war, the mass militarization brought with a new wave of brought with it, brought with it a new wave of dehumanization. In one follow-up interview to his survey, a SWAT commander, a SWAT commander told Kraska, referring to the use of his team for, patro- for routine patrols, "When the soldiers ride in, you should see. When the soldiers ride in, when the soldiers ride in, you should see those black people scatter." Former San Jose Police Chief Joseph McNamara told National Journal in 2000 that at a recent SWAT conference he had attended, officers were wearing these very disturbing shirts. On the front, there were pictures of SWAT officers. On the front, there were pictures of SWAT officers dressed in dark uniforms, wearing helmets, wearing helmets and holding submachine guns. Below was written, we don't do drive-by shooting. On the back, there was a picture of a demolished house. Below was written, we stop. Okay, we're going to keep going. Gonna... That's just... Uh... Kraska found more evidence of the mindset problem in a separate ethnograph- ethnographic, ethnographic study he conducted. As part of the study... He had been he had been invited to sit on an informal and probably illegal session for police officers. The session was taught by two members of an elite military unit with whom he had become friendly and worked with which with whom he had become friendly and who worked with several police departments that were developing or in the process of developing SWAT like units. The actual training Turned out to be a little more of a group of cops and soldiers, of group of cops and soldiers, gathering in a remote area to shoot big guns. But before the police officers arrived, Kraska talked to the trainers about the proliferation of SWAT teams. This this shit is going all over, one of them said. Why serve an arrest warrant to some crack dealer with a 38? With full armor, the right shit, and training, you can kick ass and have fun. The other trainer jumped in. Most of these guys just like to play war. They get a rush out of search and destroy missions instead of the bullshit they normally do. When the trainees arrived, all active duty cops, either on a SWAT team or soon to be, Kraska described what he saw. Several had lightweight retractable combat knives strapped to their belts. The three were authentic army fatigue pants with t-shirts. One wore a t-shirt that carried a picture of a burning city with gunship helicopters flying overhead in the caption, Operation Ghetto Storm. Another wore a tight black shirt with initials NTOA for National Tactical Officers Association. A few, of the, a few of the younger officers wore Oakley wrapped sunglasses on the heads and sported, and sported either flat tops or military style crew cuts. The Oakleys and crew cuts were part of a muscle bound mechanis- mechanic- mechanistic? mechanistic look popular with younger police officers. The look was usually accessorized with sensory enhancement gear like night vision goggles to achieve what Crosscut called 
a techno work, a techno warrior image. He notes that the he notes that one purveyor of SWAT gear and clothing calls it Cyborg, calls calls its line Cyborg 21st. Later, Kraska wrote, a guy who had served as a sniper both in the military and on SWAT team and on the SWAT team put up a demonstration for the group. The rest of the officers sat in awe as he popped off. As he popped up, head to eye jugs of water sitting behind plates of glass. The sniper, Crosco observed, was held in especially high esteem in the paramilitary subculture because he embodied the skill, discipline, endurance, and mindset necessary to execute people from long distances in a variety of situations. That sounds like a terrible human being. Okay, let me just go and check, make sure. Okay. Um, okay. If you got any type of... Okay. My fault, I thought we were... Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. Uh, most interesting are Kraska's observations about his own state of mind during the training session. There's a point in which Okay. There's a point in which there's a point in his narrative where one of the trainers asks him if they want if he wants to take a turn with the MP5. Kraska is reluctant, but after some prodding, gives the weapon a try. I fired at a body-sized target, and just as the officer surely anticipated, I made all the mistakes. All, I made all the mistakes of someone who had never fired an automatic. He took some ribbing, then was surprised to hear himself defending his masculinity to the group of virtual, uh, to the group of virtual strangers by pointing out that he had grown up with sh hunting with shotguns. Presented with a shotgun, he then redeemed himself with what he calls a personally, a personally satisfying demonstration. Kraska found even, that, even though he was there as an observer and likely would never see them again, he also felt a rush of power. A rush of power. I had an intense I had an intense sense of operating on the boundary of legitimate and illegitimate behavior. Clearly, much of the activity itself was illegal, although reporting it would never have resulted in being defined as criminal. I felt at ease. I felt at ease and in some ways defiant. I've had this experience in the past where field researching police officers and I realize that in a sense I am backing in I am back I am basking in the security of my temporary status as a beneficiary of the state sanctioned use of force. This is likely the same intoxicating feeling of autonomy from the law that is experienced by an abusive police officer. On a personal level, what disturbed me most was how I as a person who had so thoroughly th uh, thought out militarism, can have so easily enjoyed experiencing it. This study illustrates the expansive and seductive powers of a deeply embedded ideology of violence. The officers with SWAT and Dynamic Entry experience, experience interviewed for this book say raids are order of magnitude that say raids are more are orders of magnitude more intoxicating than anything else in police work. Ironically, many cops describe them with language usually used to describe the drugs the raids are conducted to confiscate. Oh, it's a huge rush, Franklin says. Those times when you have to kick down a door is just a big shot of adrenaline down in Greece. It's a rush, and you have to be careful because raids themselves can be habit-forming. 
Jimmy Haas, Jimmy Hayes. We go Hayes. Jimmy Hayes, a former special agent with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, who went on multiple narcotics money la- went on multiple narcotics money laundering and human trafficking raids, says the thrill of the raid. Says the thrill of a raid may factor into why narcotics cops just don't consider less volatile means of serving search warrants. The thing is, it's so much safer to wait the suspects out. Waiting people out is so much better. You've done your investigation, so you know their routine. So you wait until the guy leaves, and you do a routine, and you do a routine traffic stop, and you arrest them. That's the safest way to do it. But you have to understand that a lot of these cops are meatheads. They think this stuff is cool. And they get hooked on that jolt of energy they get during a raid. So these aren't... Uh, the Again, those... Uh, I touched on it in the book. But those folks that wanted to be police officers... Probably, probably the ones that shouldn't be. These uh, people who are monger, money... Uh, not money hungry. Who are power hungry or have been in some situation where uh, they may have been abused or a situation like that. These people, these, uh, these people who are becoming police officers are not of the right mindset. These are, hold on, let me see, where, where, where was that? Oh, okay. He called them meatheads. I think that's funny. I haven't heard nobody called meatheads in a long time. Hello. I don't know what she said. Okay. The 1996 election may have, re- may have represented a turning point in public opinion about marijuana. Despite heavy campaigning by the office of Clinton drug czar Barry McCaffrey and the federal government and the federal government in general, California, California voters overwhelmingly passed a overwhelmingly passed a ballot initiative to legalize marijuana for medicinal for medical purposes. Arizona voters passed an even more permissible law, permissive law, but the state legislator effectively repealed it in the following year. Over the next 16 years, 17 more states and the, distri- and the District of Columbia would pass medical marijuana laws, 11 of them through ballot initiatives. And all of this led to the historic 2012 election results in which voters in Washington State and Colorado legalized the drug outright. I remember uh, that Super Bowl. <laughs> I remember that Super Bowl was uh, Denver Broncos or uh, Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> That's what I remember. I was 12 years old when that happened. But the federal government wasn't about to let people. But the federal government wasn't about to let sick people start using smoke. I'm sorry. But the federal government wasn't about to let sick people. Just started smoking pot without a fight. After the 1996 election, McCaffrey called McCaffrey called a press conference to denounce California voters. Nothing has changed, McCaffrey said. This is not a medical proposition. This is a legal. This is the legalization of drugs that we're concerned about. This is not medicine. This is a Chichen Chong show. And now what we are uh, and now what we are committed to doing is to look in a scientific way at any proposition that would bring a new medicine to the assistance of the American of the American medical establishment. Naturally, there was no such medicine in the office in the office. Months later, the Clinton administration announced that doctors who recommended pot to their patients would not only lose their DEA license, would not only lose their DEA license, but also face criminal charges. 
months later, the Clinton administration announced the doctors who recommended pot to their patients would not only lose their DEA license, but could also face criminal charges. In 2000, a federal judge chastised Clinton, chastised the Clinton administration for threatening doctors who even mentioned the medical benefits of marijuana to their AIDS and cancer patients. The medical marijuana fight also began what would become a new and especially disturbing chapter in the story of police militarization in America. The use of heavy-handed mar- the use of heavy-handed paramilitary raids to send a political message. When the DEA began raiding when the DEA began raiding marijuana suppliers in California and then also in the states that subsequently legalized the drug, they generally raided suspects who were either well-known supporters of pot or people who they believed had enormous supplies of the drug. The latter were people running businesses and operate businesses operating under operating openly under state law. Many of them had obtained business license and permits as well as permission from local law enforcement. These were not dangerous people. The use of tactical teams and frightening raids to shut down medical marijuana suppliers in California were about to send a clear, unambiguous message to other pot suppliers around the state. Openly defy the federal government and you can expect the blunt force of federal power to be brought down upon you. One of those early raids was on a medical marijuana farm run by Todd McCormick and Peter McWilliams in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Bel Air. Both men, both men had become advocates. Both men had become advocate, had become advocates of the drug after using it to treat symptoms of their own serious illnesses. McCormick smoked pot to treat the pain to treat the pain associated with a cancer with a cancer treatment that had fused two of his vertebrae. McWilliams had both AIDS and non and non Hodgkin's lymphoma brought on by AIDS. Smoking marijuana relieved his nausea, which helped him which helped him keep down the medication he took. He took both to manage his AIDS and during his chemotherapy for the cancer. McWilliams was also a self-help author who had become an outspoken civil liberties a- activist. With, re- with respect to Pot, he made no attempt to hide the fact that while it was saving his life, it also made him feel good. The Pot, the pot helped him keep down his medicine, though the pain associated with his conditions and took his mind off the fact that he was suffering from them. None of that was enough to get McCormick and McWilliams out from under the federal, out from the boot of the federal government. Mc, McWilliams describes the first moments of the raid. A hard pounding on the door, accompanied by shots of police, open up, broke the silence. Broke my revert, reverie, broke my um, I were very angry, we're very, and nearly broke down the door. I opened the door. I opened the door wearing st- standard writer's attire, a bathrobe. <laughs> okay, that's a joke. He got jokes. I opened the door wearing standard writer's attire, a bathrobe, and was immediately handcuffed. I was taken outside by drug enforcement administra- administration DEA agents, ran through my house. Gun drawn, commando style. They were looking, they were looking, I suppose, for the notorious, well armed, highly trained medical medical marijuana militia. To the DEA, I am the godfather of the medicine cartel. Oh, come on! Finding nothing, they took me, to, they took me back into my home, and informed me that I was not under arrest, and ordered me, still in handcuffs to sit down. I was merely being restrained, I was told. So the DE agents the, so the DEA agents could enforce the search warrant. The two men 
for unquestionably growing marijuana. The police found some 4,000 plants. The entire operation was legal under California law, but because they were brought up on federal charges and tried in federal court, a jury wouldn't be allowed to hear anything about California law. McWilliams was also barred from telling the jury that, according to his doctors, marijuana was keeping him alive. Because all that because all that information would be kept from any poli- from any potential jury, McWilliams really had no choice but to plead guilty and hope for leniency. After his arrest, McWilliams' mother put her house up as collateral to help post his bail. One of the conditions of McWilliams' bail was that he refrained from smoking marijuana. Federal prosecutors told McWilliams' mother that if he failed the drug test, or was caught with even a trace of pot in his possession, they take her house. So to protect his mother, McWilliams refrained from ta- from using the drug. He died before he could be sentenced. McWilliams was found dead in his apartment on June 14, 2000. Overcome with nausea, he had choked and a- he had choked and aspirated, aspirated on his own vomit. Tributes popped up all over the political spectrum. Conservative icon and pot champion William F. Buckley devoted a column to eulogizing McWilliams. Drug war, drug war reformers and libertarians snapped up his book. And probably his most lasting legacy. Ain't nobody's business if you do. An eloquent defense of John Stuart Mill's harm principle. And yet... And yet, to those on the other side, the federal prosecutors who went after him, the DEA agents who raided him, Barry McCaffrey, Janet Reno, and Bill, and Bill Clinton, Peter, Will- Peter McWilliams was just more collateral damage. Are you going to stick around for the group discussion? I'm going to ask you every day. Uh, Having it earlier. Yeah, we could do that one of the days. We could do that. Um, can I can I ask you this question now then? Okay, yeah. Can I ask you a question now? Let me come over here a little bit. Okay. So what I'm reading about uh, right now is the. I just want to make sure I got the year right. This happened in, I'm sorry, so after the 1996 election, the uh, California legalized medical marijuana, right? Mm -hmm. And you are, you're a lot older than me, right? You're you're a lot older than me. So you've, uh, well, you also, I think I can say this, you're a a supporter of marijuana, right? Yes. 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 So you've seen the uh, different uh, avenues and different... um, that you've been uh, alive and you've been uh, stigmatized, uh, seen the yeah. uh, uh, negative stigmatization was, uh, of the illegal, uh, marijuana. Except so, for all, in all states except for go ahead, Alaska, go. I think. In all states except for Alaska? It was illegal. Really? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I guess uh, my question would just be, is you've seen kind of the growth of that from it being... Uh, criminalized and them doing uh, spot arrays for uh, a couple baggies of marijuana to being to where it is today and uh, about where like, it is legal. When I was in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. I was living in Las Vegas. They, you know, people there would tell you you can't get caught with a seed. If you get caught with one seed, you, it's like a felony. Really? Yeah. A seed. Yeah, a seed. Wow. Wow. Like no tolerance, no zero count. tolerance shit. And obviously, you know, it is. Uh, how many states is it legal in? Do you know that just off the top of your head? But obviously, not exactly. Not exactly. But, um, but still, and there's and, and it can't be described in that easily terms because yes, it's not. Yes. Some are decriminalized. Mm-hmm. Some are medicalized. You know, mm-hmm. and different laws. You know, our law sucks. You know, like I sit in the court a lot, and uh-huh. I see a lot of 
people still getting, it's supposedly legal, but they're still getting uh, possession charges because they have, them, have it in their car mm. and it's not in the proper container or it's not from the right place or, you know, poor people, poor and predominantly black people are still being rung up for cannabis while white affluent uh, corporation and corporations make billions. Mm-hmm. And that's something we can touch on a little bit. Uh, people are still being charged in this uh, kangaroo city court for yeah. marijuana possession. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's often five hundred dollars, pow. And I, I've never I've been around for one of it where it was uh, where they seemingly young teens or teenagers. Yeah. Young yeah, children. It's like from what we found out, it was uh, to do with the school. Really? Like if, yeah, they're caught in school. They get the five hundred dollar fine. And this is separate from legal matters or actual yeah. court proceedings. Right. This is just you owe the, the city the of case, Rockford. Yeah, city of Rockford. This and you can't win. That it's not a court of law. Mm-hmm. And no matter what you what you say, you could say it was not mine. That was not me. I can prove that it's not me. They'll say liable every time. I've never. I've the whole time I've sat up in that kangaroo court. Mm-hmm. Every single case is liable. Even the woman that said she was not there, it was not me. Liable. And it's important to note that the uh, the demographic of the people up there are mostly black people and people of color. Yes. Most. Extremely yes. mostly. Like, like, the day that I went and there was a line out the door, one of the first times we were in there on a Wednesday, yeah. I was the only white person. There's like 20 people up there. I was the only white person. Okay. So, obviously, uh, in terms of marijuana laws, there's still um, a lot of work to be done. It's, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. it's often... Uh, there's still people in jail for marijuana yeah. laws, and yeah, still right. are people in jail who are well, all. Certain, all drugs should be decriminalized. All drugs. They okay. should be medicalized, like they should have been from the beginning. Um, you know, especially like the hard, hardest drugs like heroin. Mm-hmm. A a large a large percentage. I don't know what the percentage, but a large percentage of people that are on heroin got that way from the medical. In you know industry or from having pills, you mm-hmm. know like they have back pain, they get the pills, they get on the pills, they get addicted to the pills, and then they lose their prescription, and then they're out on the street and they're trying to get that fix, mm-hmm. and then the next thing you know they they've lost everything, they're on the street, you know uh, that's a medical problem. Mm-hmm. It is. I, I agree. I'm not um, what, um, I don't know how this. I mean, the, the last few books. Uh huh. This one we're reading today, and what was the other one? Uh, this one. Locking up locking our own. Locking up our own. Um. And to some extent, the new Jim Crow and end of policing. Uh. Really hits home with the it's you know mass incarceration and uh is a all these things stem from the drug war. You know, like a major impotence for all of this is the drug war. Um, that they wage disproportionately against poor people and people of color. And I think to this day, I think a problem with that is that, kind of like what you were saying earlier, uh, it's marijuana where it is legal it's often white people profiting off the legalization of it it's white people yeah. who own these uh, dispensaries it's white people yes. who are making this type of yeah. money have a good night our law mm-hmm. our law is has uh you know stipulation in it or whatever that says that they're supposed to give a break to minority owners in certain areas so there's an area that they made and the west side of Rockford, that if you're a black person in the west side of Rockford, you get a deal on a on a dispensary. Mm. But the the legal hoops and the the bureaucratic hoops that you have to get in order to just have the dispensary 
are so great that there is not a single one. There's no there's no dispensary on the west side and there is no dispensary in Rockford that's owned by a black person. Even though there's incentives for black people to own these businesses in certain areas that have been ravaged by the drug war. Like they tried to make amends or whatever, but their amends are so hard and the you know, it's so difficult these bureaucratic hoops, you know, like the state police mm -hmm. have to come and inspect your shit weekly. You really? know, like they're coming in your place, like mm. all, all growing, uh, transportation of it and dispensary all are overseen by the state police. Mm. Like how mm -hmm. comfortable do you think most people are that are real people want to have a dispensary that you know had something you know I assume a, a large portion of people that want to have that kind of business have been in that business for years and they don't want the state police coming to their dispensary weekly hello I mean you know yeah. pe their friends are uh, doing life in prison yep yeah. You think they want to invite the state police? I don't know. There's five. There's five. Um, I was planning on wrapping up this chapter and getting into our group discussion. You did a lot of reading today. <laughs> I did a little bit, yeah. I yeah. Did a bit. Um, got about 20 more pages left. A little, about 20 more pages. This is, uh, we're still reading the book. We just took a break. This is separate from the group discussion. Yeah, this is just a little aside. I've been trying to get Terry in these group discussion. He's been... Uh, Are we going to do it? Uh, we were just doing a preemptive. Preemptive. Yeah, I, I, like, uh, I, I got him in. I reeled him in. I reeled him in a little bit. Oh, well, he's like asking me, and he said he's going to ask me every day. And I was like, well, you know, someday we'll do it early. It's like, by the time you want to do it, I need to leave. Right. Yeah. And he said, well, why don't we do it right now? And I'm like, okay. Because <laughs> okay. we're fluid, right? We are fluid. We're, uh, what's that uh, phrase that gets thrown around that is used, uh, not thrown around, but it's used sometimes? Uh, be water? Yeah, be, be water. Be yeah. water. We're fluid. 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 What, um, what, what chapter was it that you read? Um, that you read? Do you remember? I think I read four and five. I think I read five. I think I read five. You read four? Terry definitely read one, too. Hmm. One and then Terry, the other, well, technically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, technically Terry read up through chapter five, I think. <laughs> the Terry's read. Um, I read the I read the very beginning, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Let me go. Ahead, go ahead. Uh, you got it. Yeah, I got my page. I got my page. I have chapter eight. Too. No, no, it's chapter. Uh, it's, no, I got. I know. I know. You know. I know. Okay. I know. Uh, Hello. The beginning really gets into the the history of and discusses about whether cops are constitutional. Which is really interesting. Really? Yeah, like, you know, they, they say basically that they're not constitutional, but that they're, that the world is totally changed from when the Constitution was written. So, mm. well, they do say that, uh, that they're not anti-police. And that they think there's good cops. Yes, that is something reiterated throughout the book. That this idea that there are good cops and that yeah, uh, there are some police chiefs and police departments that are going about things the right way. It is. Uh, uh, Leslie has said something that you had said something about the, this book about hey maybe you didn't line ideologically ideologically. But there were yeah. still things to get from the book. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I per personally, I feel like if I had a discussion with him, we would probably argue. Mm. 
but I like the book. You know, like, I, I like I like the book, and I think it's a you know it's powerful. The you know uh, yes, no, it is. the the using the DC his experience as a DC uh, public defender, and you know you know that really draws me in because I go to court all the time and I have dealings with the public defender, and I'm learning that whole mm-hmm. system of oppression and broken criminal justice system to hear his perspective of like how we got here Uh um you know you know I I think I've been caught up in this myself I blame a lot of the you know the rise of uh of um mass incarceration to like the presidents you know like Mm -hmm. uh nixon reagan clinton or the you know those are the presidents in my mind that that brought about this behemoth of prison industrial complex Mm -hmm. but he really details how in a on a local setting and and then his example in dc where it's 70 percent black and he goes to courtrooms where the judge is black, the clerk is black, the bail is black, the lawyers are black, the people that are on, on trial are black, that they, and they, that they pushed for these things that, that created the mass incarceration as well. They went along with uh, Bill Clinton's crime bill. You know, like, it seems very racist from this end. Mm-hmm. The crime bill is incredibly racist. But black people were for it, mm. even in, in like, and you know, some, some black and, people. yes, but, and, and that's what you would think too, that yes, maybe affluent blacks or some middle class blacks, but like he details how people in the ghetto, they're poor and like mm. mothers of his clients and stuff, uh, seen these open air drug markets on their corner mm-hmm. and the surround like one example they gave us like they the the drug market surrounded in an elementary school and the in the elementary school kids had to go through a barrage of crack dealers mm. to get to school in the morning uh you know it got to be where you know the poor you know very poor uh, black people in Washington D.C. You know, we're we're pushing for some of these draconian drug laws. Uh, you know, because of their lived experience with dealing with these uh, like open air drug markets mm-hmm. and all the the crime that w- goes along with it, and you know, they really equate back then. They really equated. Uh, drugs with crime you know uh, if you were a drug dealer you they felt you were responsible for any crime that anybody that bought drugs from you did like mm. you brought that on and so like they they really uh, villainized these drug dealers um And so people within their own communities were, you know, supporting, uh, you know, three strikes, you're out. And, uh, you know, these things that got, you know, uh, leveled disproportionately to poor and black people and people of color. Uh, it was incredibly racist over the, the time period, uh, you know, and that I think of as like presidents bringing about was actually, you know, support had pretty wide set, widespread support. So, did you read the part with you read the part with the Black Lives Matter part? Did you read the part that talked about like? The, Black 
think I did. That was it in this one? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I think that was that sounds like it was further along in the book than than I got. Yeah, I really wish I really wish it didn't flip the image. I keep show I kept yeah. showing the picture, and then mm -hmm. I'd look at the video, and it would be flipped. Mm -hmm. Picture really at home, seeing that like it's one thing to see wires and quotations, but if it's in a magazine picture, you know, like concept out there, supported. Yeah. What um? While he looks for that, it seems that uh, each decade almost had their different drug that was uh, really heavily focused on. The, it seems like the nine. Yeah. What do you think about? You know, like, it, well, it goes back a lot further than that. Go ahead, go ahead. So it seems like you know, like if yeah, if you go back, but you know, there was. There's a big difference between how the country has reacted in different periods and different eras and different drugs with different communities, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, back in the 20s and 30s, you know, uh, there was a big heroin epidemic amongst black people, you know, uh, that nobody gave a shit about, <laughs> you know, like they just, you know, like, mm -hmm. They didn't care, yeah. you know, like, whereas now there's this, you know, this heroin epidemic because suburban white kids are dying. I don't, want to, I don't want to keep you for too much longer. Okay, yeah, it's 512. Yeah, 512. I should probably go home. Okay. Get some sleep. All right, all right. We'll see you. Be back here at uh, midnight. Midnight to read. What are we reading tomorrow? You know? One of these? That one right there at the top. Until we reckon? Yes. It's about uh, the opposite side. It probably about non-violent offenders, and this one is about uh, mm. Okay. I was looking. I don't even remember this one. What day was this? Three. Oh, Saturday. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. So we reckon. Okay. Drive safe. Car is yeah. dangerous. Mm. Probably just happened with a car earlier today. Uh, tomorrow is the lady's birthday. Oh. Mm. Mm. I don't know how I'm gonna. I'm gonna okay. have to do something. Okay. Yeah, just let us know. I'm, uh, I don't know. I'm fluid. <laughs> <laughs> We're fluid. Yeah, everyone's yeah, fluid. Everyone's All, fluid. Right. Yeah. All right. But I will be here at midnight. All right. We'll see you. <laughs> All right. We'll see you. Okay. Um, let me see. How do you think we should go about this? What do you say? I don't know what they're saying. I, I was saying, how do you think we should go about this? Because this is a, like I, I was still reading. Oh, damn. Like I was still reading, then I just, I just, you know, I oh, brought them in. Uh, I brought them in. But I got 20 more pages of this chapter happened. left. And it's already, you know, hey. already 5.15. Oh. I'm good with just ending this live for now, doing the group discussion, and starting back up. All right. So we're going to end this live right now. Let me whack your fast. Okay, we're gonna end this live now. We're gonna get started back up in a group discussion about about five minutes. Oh, sh in about five minutes, we're gonna get started back up in this group discussion.